Joining me now is Wisconsin Governor Republican Scott Walker. He's written a new book, Unintimidated, a governor's story and a nation's challenge. He joins us now from Madison. Hello, Governor. I want to start with the theme, overarching theme of this book and your argument, which is that what you've been able to do in Wisconsin should be a model for Republicans across the nation and in Washington. So let's think about that with respect to health care. You fought the president's health care law in the courts. You also uh, d declared that you didn't want any additional Medicaid money uh, from that. But once it was passed, you said it's the law, and you put some of your citizens into the federal exchange. Is that the model for Republicans that, now that the law is passed, work within it uh, and, and not try these efforts to continue to repeal it? Well, I think long-term, a much better option for us here in Wisconsin across for us here in Wisconsin and across the country is to replace it with something better, uh, market-driven, just as Senator Corker talked about before. But for us, we didn't take the Medicaid expansion. We didn't do a, a state exchange. We've now put everyone, we'll be putting everyone as a, the first, a second quarter of this coming year, everyone living in poverty will be covered for the first time in our state's history, and everyone living above it will be transitioned to the marketplace. Uh, but we actually have fewer people on Medicaid than we did before this program, and uh, fewer people living directly in government dependency. So that's what we're doing in the time being. But I think long term, it's not the status quo. We can't go back to the status quo. What we need to do is go to a market-driven position where the tax incentives are the same whether you buy it through your employer, whether you buy it individually, or whether you do what most people, I think, would intend to do, and that is buy it through a health savings account. You talk about that market-driven approach. Uh, in Washington, the Republicans went home to Thanksgiving, uh, and, and you also said that the, that the Republicans should not just say no to the president. So Republicans in Washington went home for Thanksgiving with a 40-page booklet about how they could exploit the problems the president is having with his uh, health care program. Good politics, maybe, but you seem to be saying that Republicans need to offer an alternative. Is that right? I do. And I think overall, one of the things I wrote about in this book is austerity is not the answer reform is. What Americans are hungry for, and I think the reason why I won in a state where a few months later the president of the United States carried that state by the same margin or about the same margin, just over seven percentage points, was because in both cases, those undecided, persuadable voters, more than anything, want leadership. They want people to stand up and boldly tell them what they're going to do and then go out and do it. In our case, I think there is a much better market-driven solution when it comes to health care, entitlement reforms, or other areas. We just have to be uh, have the courage to stand up and do it, and we're doing it in the states and that's where Republicans are the most successful today. When you talk about in your book the sour politics of austerity, are you talking about your cousins in Washington, the Republicans running things here? Well, I, you know, I talk about the difference between Republicans in Washington and Republicans in the states. And one of the key differences is we talk about things that are relevant and optimistic. We talk about fixing schools, balancing budgets, getting the economy going again. We don't talk about sequesters and fiscal cliffs and debt ceilings. Uh, those are things a handful of people in politics pay attention to. What Americans want are people with the courage to stand up and fight for them, not fight against each other, fight for the hardworking taxpayers. And in America, there are 30 Republican governors doing exactly that just as we speak. Many of those 30 Republican governors, and you, uh, have the benefit of having legislature that's all rowing in the same direction, mostly. It's all Republicans. So in Washington, that's not the case, famously, and it's got everybody here stuck a little bit. So how do you transfer the Wisconsin model, where everybody's on the same team, to Washington, where they're not, and that causes a lot of gridlock? Well, you know, historically, a lot of the talk, the conventional wisdom in Washington was that divided government was somehow good because it would be checks and balances. I think most of us across this country have seen divided government just leads to more fighting and bickering and gridlock. In Wisconsin and many other of the battleground states in the Midwest, in 2010, we focused on our economic and fiscal crises, laid out a clear plan, and then... Uh, voters in, in, in my state and many other of my surrounding states gave Republicans not only the governor's office, but the majorities in the state assembly and the state senator similar measures in the legislature. And I think that's the case. In 2014, Republicans need to lay out an optimistic message to regain the United States Senate. And then two years later after that, if the House and the Senate are controlled by Republicans, then a Republican nominee needs to make that ultimate case to give the party a chance to show what we can do, just like we've done successfully in state after state all across this great country. So anybody running for president, uh, this talk of being able to work across the aisle, uh, that's not useful in your, in your view. 
Well, no, I mean, I think it is. I mean, there are instances where that can work, whether one party's in control or, or it's split uh, government out there. But I think in the end, what people want to hear is whether it's Democrat or Republican, they want to hear, hear a clear plan of how they'll move forward. I think the more people look at the mess in Washington, they'll realize that divided government does not work, that the gridlock, the fighting for the sake of fighting is not working. If you look at states, I mean, look across America. Uh, since last year's convention, I pointed out at the convention speech and just about every month since then, that the unemployment rate in states led by Republican governors is consistently almost 1% lower, 1% better than in states led by Democrat governors. That's a real choice. People can look at the difference between the failures in Illinois, for example, versus is the, the benefits of what's happening in a state like Wisconsin. You compare Texas to California, Virginia to Maryland. There's example after example out there where people can see the real difference, and those are the sorts of things we talk about in our book called Unintimidated. One of the, you are uh, getting heralded for your focus, and, and so I want to ask you about that in a political context, which is you say that uh, in, in your book you say you were focused on fiscal issues. You are proudly pro-life, but you're not obsessed about it. So is that a message for the Republican Party? Focus on the fiscal issues, but when it comes to social issues, let's not be obsessed about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not backing away from my position. As you mentioned, I, I said I'm proudly pro-life, but for me, the reason I was elected in 2010, the reason I was elected again in 2012, the reason I hope I'll be eventually elected yet again in 2014, like other governors across the country, is because we focused obsessively on helping fix the economy in the private sector and helping put in place a balanced budget that can sustain us at both the state and the local level. I think people want us to do that. It's not just politically popular. It's what the people elect us to do. I got to the point in the 2010 election where I was so focused on fixing our economic and fiscal crisis. John, you could have asked me in a forum what my mother's maiden name was, and I'd say it's Fitch, and every Fitch I know cares about my plan to get the economy going again and to keep our balanced budget. What do the Fitches say, Governor, about you running for president? Oh, I mean, it's flattering. and they're, they're not talking about it because of some great speech I, I've given. They, they talk about it because we've taken real action and real reforms. And I think I'm, I'm not the only one out there. You look at governors across the country, whether it's Chris Christie, Bobby Jindal, Rick Perry, John Kasich, Susanna Martinez, Nikki Haley, Mary Fallon. There are people talking about each of them as well. Why? Because in each and every one of those states and many others like them, there are leaders in the Republican Party who are chief executives in the states getting big, bold things done. And I think that's what people are hungry for, not only in the states, but they're hungry for it across the country. All right, last question. Governor, are you running? I'm running for governor. I'll make that announcement officially in 2014, and we'll see what happens after that. Uh, ultimately, my decision will be made not just by myself and my family, but I've got to look at my state. My state's gone through a lot the last couple of years, and there's a part of me who would just like to stay focused on helping the state move forward. So we'll see what the future holds, but uh, for now, I'm focused on being governor. All right, Governor Scott Walker, thanks so much for being with us. We'll be right back.